welcome to Trade Hospitality has a drink with June Tanaka from the 9th in Charlotte Street. So welcome, June. Um, Thank you very much. Can you give us a brief intro about yourself, your connection to hospitality, the 9th? Sure. So I, I'm the chef owner of, of the 9th in London. So we opened the restaurant um, in 2015. It's a super casual neighborhood restaurant. Um, we serve French Mediterranean cuisine. So inspiration from the south of France, northern Italy, from the coastal regions, um, all the dishes are to be shared. The whole idea behind the restaurant was I wanted guests to feel they were coming to my house to eat. So that's the kind of way that I would eat or cook at home. A plates in the middle of the table and everyone just shares. So, um, well, when we could have friends and family around to the house, that is. Um, so it was kind of very relaxed and, um, you know, um, through all the hard work of, of the team um, in 2016, we got a Michelin star, which was amazing. And then we've um, kept it ever since. Amazing. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so it sounds great. Sharing plates and mixing with people. Yeah, we're sad we can't do that at the minute. <laughs> not long, not long to go. Um, so yes, just on the back of that, starting 2021 with Brexit and COVID, what are your predictions kind of for the year ahead in hospitality? Yeah, that's a difficult one. And I'm sure that's pretty much what I'm sure you do. All of us just spend our hours and days thinking about and it's, it's difficult because you have days, things change really quickly and you have days when you're feeling really positive and then other days, you know, something pops up in the news and you're, you're not quite as positive. But um, I would say Bre Brexit has taken a backseat in the last year. It's almost been forgotten about because of everything else that's going on. Yeah. So I think everyone's priority is when we come out of this lockdown and what's it going to look like? Looking at what's happening with the vaccine program, more than likely we're going to come out April or May. I think I think early May is is kind of realistic, and we'll open with um, you know social distancing and there will be restrictions. Um, but I think restaurants and pubs and bars they are going to be so busy because you know when we unlocked last July. Everyone was really busy. And back then, you know, you didn't have 20 million people vaccinated. So the older generations weren't vaccinated. So they would have felt a little bit more apprehensive about going out. But now that they are, you could probably add them to the people that are going to be eating out. Um, obviously, there's less restaurants and less pubs because of all the closures, limited seating. So I think we're going to be really busy um, and also it's you know the, the weather's going to be turning so outdoor seating is going to be available um, so I think looking at the business I think it will be good yeah. over the spring summer period as long as obviously you know all the other things like the, the cases don't, don't accelerate and the vaccine program goes according to plan um, I think it'll be good um, I do think in not being pessimistic, but I do think there'll be like a circuit breaker closure in winter again. Okay. So I think, yeah, it's going it, to, because it's never going to leave us. It's here to stay, the, the virus. And it's just kind of, you know, managing it. Um, but it will definitely accelerate in winter and there'll be like a, a break, if you like. But as long as we know you know, as long as the government gives us the guidance, say, look, you know, in three weeks or four weeks time, we're going to have a two week closure to control the virus. It's fine because everyone's kind of ready now because they have their takeaway, their DIY kits. So as long as we've got notice, making the shift is actually quite simple now. So I don't think that's gonna cause much of an issue for businesses, as long as we can get to that point. Yeah. Um, in terms of Brexit, um, yeah, Brexit's, we haven't really noticed anything because we've been closed. Yeah. Um, but I think in the future, 
Um, the UK are trying to do trade deals all around the world outside the EU now. And I think they're focus, focusing on um, Asian countries. So places like, um, I, I think there's a trading group where it incorporates Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, um, Vietnam. And I think going forward, I think you're going to have, the consumer is gonna have access to all those ingredients more readily available in supermarkets because you go to supermarket now you don't really see a huge amount of fresh produce from thailand you don't yeah, you only have to go to you can only get it in a specialist store and you might have a tiny section in a big supermarket but i think once these trade deals get done people will, will have better access to all these other ingredients that they didn't have um, beforehand which would then I think in turn, potentially you're gonna see more of those kind of restaurants opening up, but in a more contemporary form, not like your traditional Thai or, you know, you, you got those creative chefs um, that will take something traditional and make it, I guess, more contemporary. Um, and I think the other thing is uh, staff because we don't notice it now because, um, you know, no one, you know, we're not trading and, and there's fewer jobs definitely in our, in our industry. But once we get back to some kind of normality, we're going to really feel a pinch on staff shortage because it's difficult for the Europeans to, to now to come over to this country to work. So um, I think that might be an issue probably from next year sometime yeah well yeah other than the staffing I think your outlook um seems very positive I think in terms of a busy May fingers crossed you're right on that one yeah. um and yeah some fresh ingredients new kind of look on aging restaurants would yeah would definitely be welcomed I think um so it sounds super positive so yeah based on these uncertain times we're having what um, what kind of conversations are you having with your staff? Are you catching up on Zooms? I know you've um, launched these kind of make at home range. So yeah, what are you what are you talking about with your teams just now? Yeah, I think most important is you have to be completely transparent now. So, you know, we have our Zoom team meetings and I am as open as possible. So I tell them, our cash flow situation, um, the fact that we've borrowed, you know, money from the government and and we need to start paying that back this year. Um, so I, I literally, I'm like an open book and I think it's important because everyone's worried about their jobs for sure. And so it's really important that they have an overview of everything because a lot of times when you work for a company, you only get to see a very narrow portion of it. And also, um, you know, you're very kind of, as everyone is, very concerned about yourself. Um, so it's important for everyone to have a better understanding to see completely the bigger picture and not to hide anything. So I will tell them about the cash flow and when, you know, if this goes on for X amount of months and, and we don't get to open till May, June, July, August, when are we going to run out of money? You know, and I'm open about that. I, I told them how much money we borrowed from the bank, what the repayments are going to be. Um, and also, you know, the things we're trying to do, like, you know, we, we're doing these um, assembled at home boxes, which is um, like everyone is doing, you know, everything made as simple as possible for the, for the consumer to, to reheat at home. Um, and also getting their input. You know, you need to um, get their ideas uh, to see what their thoughts are and also what their worries are, which they have a lot of. And, you know, you have to kind of try to involve everyone in the, the thought process of how are we going to get out of it? Um, because it's in everyone's interest that we do. And so when you do that and you ask their opinion, I think it makes them feel their part even more kind of invested in the business surviving and doing well. And so 
I think that that part of it is really important. Yeah, yeah, I've certainly seen um, teams kind of come a lot closer together during this, and I think I think that's the best one of the best things about hospitality. Um, people kind of live yeah. and breathe the industry, um, which is great to see. Um, yeah, so we've kind of already brushed um, upon this, but do you expect to see any other trends um, within restaurants or within the industry this year? Any other trends? Um, I think um, it wouldn't, it, it's not trends. I think this whole um, pandemic has made everybody think about business in terms of how they run it, what they do, and even their people's personal finance, it shows that you have to be diversified. So you can't rely on one revenue stream, whether it is bums on seats in the restaurant, it's not, I don't think it's gonna cut it. And so you have to have different elements to your business where if this happens again, that you can you know, quickly shift to something different. And ongoing, I think people will think about being able to weather another kind of uh, weather another storm basically and being adaptable and not putting yeah all your eggs in one basket and I think that's really important I think that's a lesson that everyone's learned um, do I think these DIY boxes and takeaway will be as busy as when we come out of lockdown no I don't I think it'll there'll be a massive drop because you know, these work when there is no other option, but I know everybody is dying to go and have a drink in a pub, to see their friends, eat in a restaurant. And I think, you know, as soon as you open up, I think there'll be a huge drop. So the question, I guess, is do you carry that on after you open or not? Because it will be kind of, there'll be a massive kind of drop in, in business. But I guess if you're, if it's just doing a little bit, that's fine because it's another kind of arm to your business. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the main thing is businesses um, just rethinking uh, what they do and being as diversified as possible. Yeah, definitely. I like, yeah, don't put all your eggs in one basket is um, definitely some sound yeah. advice going forward, I think. Um, what other advice do you have? Do you have any other kind of words of wisdom for operators to get by in the next couple of months? Um, I don't think I'm in any position to advise. I think there's a lot of the operators doing a lot, kind of managing this a lot better than I am. Um, you know, for me, the most important is cash flow. Yeah. You know, that is just the most important thing. So I'm, you know, that's, a lot of my focus goes on that essentially because it's not about making a profit now it's it's about surviving so cash flow is really important which means that you just have to know every single pence that's coming out of that business where it's going is it essential can we reduce it cut it do we actually need it and i think you know so what i've did well, I did this in the first lockdown was literally went through absolutely everything and just asked myself, is this really necessary? And then if it isn't, can we do it a cheap way? Would it really make a difference to a guest experience? And then, um, yeah, just made the necessary changes. So this is our, essentially a third lockdown. It was very quick. As soon as, you know, it happened, I just completely shut everything off and I know exactly how much it costs just to be locked down and do nothing and I think that's really important yeah yeah definitely. Um, yeah cool yes um so our third lockdown we've had quite a bit of experience in the opening and closing <laughs> um so what have you been cooking during lockdown anything exciting at home um, so it's changed. I, get, I think the first lockdown, um, because it was quite a novelty, I guess, having so much time at home and being able to cook. So it was a little bit more elaborate than it is now. So first lockdown, you know, 
doing kind of, and also it was kind of spring summer, wasn't it? So um, I was using the uh, my uh, Kamado Joe, which is like a, uh, it's like a, it's a barbecue essentially, okay. ceramic barbecue. So I was doing whole turbot on there and and whole sea bass. Um, yeah, I was doing mussels and scallops. Um, but I think on the whole, um, what I cook at home is quite healthy. So I love vegetables. So I cook a lot of vegetables, um, loads of seafood. Um, I think this lockdown, um, I'm cooking more healthily, even yeah. more than before. So, um, so in the first lockdown, yeah, so no desserts now, <laughs> no, no, no sweets, um, no cakes or any baking like that. Um, a lot of vegetables. So I would say, you know, seven days, so four days a week vegetarian. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, two days a week, um, I, I think we'd have fish. One, one day a week we, we have meat. Um, and yeah, I think um, just trying to, to be as healthy as possible. Good, yeah. I think with Veganuary, um, a lot more people are conscious of eating vegetables. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that brings a trend. Um, and what, what have you been drinking? I know a lot of people try and avoid Boris's brew things, but what's your go-to tipple if and when you watch them? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, anything with uh, alcohol. <laughs> um, so with, yeah, I mean, I, I my, my go-to drink is red wine. Um, but yeah, I try to avoid listening to Boris now because I, yeah. I find it really difficult. I don't believe a word that comes out of his mouth now. <laughs> and and this, my other thing is, you know, and it's interesting because in the past year, um, you know, this is, you know, a crisis, a world crisis that, you know, we've never, you know, encountered in, in a generation. But, but you can really see it's times like this that you see true leaders and Boris isn't one of them. And it's it's good to know because, you know, if this, this didn't happen, you probably wouldn't have thought that. You know, he comes out with funny comments and, you know, he's got quite, quite a kind of... Um, a boisterous extrovert kind of, uh, character so without something like this you you wouldn't have seen his shortcomings as quickly but now you really notice he's not a leader and and the main reason is um he is completely indecisive and you know when a leader whatever else needs to be decisive for, for good or bad right or wrong they have to make a decision and they have to do it efficiently and just go ahead with it and and he's not that person and uh, yeah which is um yeah something that i've learned <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, so in terms of his briefings um yeah i try not to um i try not to listen to them i try <laughs> to it's really difficult not to to read the news or, or to watch the news. Absolutely. So I try and limit myself to the coffee in the morning, and then maybe uh, once more at night, and, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important, especially during the first lockdown. I watch the briefing every day at five o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, and now yeah. absolutely, I try <laughs> and avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, so where would be first on your list to travel to when when we can? Oh uh, yeah, uh, that's so many places. So last year we were supposed to go to Argentina September last year. Mm -hmm. So um, I had the deposit paid, and then we tried to get the money back. They wouldn't do that, so they delayed it for a year. So September this year we're supposed to go, but if you look at South America, probably not somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I know it's eight months away, but I'm not sure whether we'll be able to go. I hope so. Um, but failing that, um, Italy. Yeah, I love it. It's my favorite country in the world. It's, you know, I love the food, the, the kind of the landscape, everything about it. And um, 
as soon as we're able, that's the first place that I would go, definitely. Yeah, not a bad choice at all. How about you? Anywhere? Um, anywhere, yeah, anywhere. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd love to do France, I think. I, I'm just really missing that kind of culture of coffee, wine, um, yeah, and good food. I'd love to kind of cycle around the vineyards of France, I think. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. But we'll see. Just the idea of getting away just seems like such a luxury, doesn't it? It does, I know. We were spoiled yeah. before. Um, so other than travel, what are you most looking forward to um, when we come out of this lockdown? Like everyone, just seeing friends and family, going out, uh, yeah, just the simple things, going for a drink with with some friends down the pub, really. Um, yeah, seeing my parents, I haven't seen my you know, nieces and my brother for a long time. So um, yeah, I'm sure it's, it's yeah. exactly the same for everyone. Reuniting, absolutely. Um, and final question. I see you've got quite a lot of books behind you. Um, have you picked up any hobbies, anything that might stick during this lockdown that you'll Kind of continue to do yeah so so this is our third lockdown so after the first lockdown it was three months and i looked back and i thought you know there was a lot of wasted time because how often do you get that much time at home so um so when i uh, so the second lockdown in november i started i thought right i'm going to make the most of it and so um I started an online course, so on memory. So I took an online course, uh, like a three month course on how to improve your memory. Wow. Uh, just everything from, you know, how remembering uh, people's names to remembering what you have to do for the day, because we rely so much on our phones for everything, right? That you, you don't actually use that part of your brain. And sometimes I thought I'm so forgetful. So, um, so I did that and then I really enjoyed it. And then I just finished um, a course today actually on uh, quick reading. So speed reading. So how to, how to read quicker um, because I love reading. Um, so I, I, I read and also I listen to audio books. Yeah. Um, so audio books are amazing because you can do two things at once. So you can work out and listen to an audio book yeah. Or you can cook and listen to an audio book. And there's so much, um, yeah, so many things um, that, um, yeah, that I'm interested in. It's quite nice to, to kind of, um, you know, just go for a walk and listen to a book. And um, I think that's my favourite thing at the moment is listening to audio books. Yeah, and having the time to do so as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're both really interesting. I think, yeah, quick reading and memory. I haven't heard of anyone doing either of these things, which, yeah. Yeah, I, I think with the quick reading, because I'm really, I'm really, I am a very slow reader and I notice it. And so, um, yeah, for saving time. And I thought it would be, yeah, it will be interesting. And actually the first thing they say is, you know, no one actually teaches you to read beyond your 11, you know, 10 or 11, you stop, yeah. they stop teaching you to read. Right? So actually your reading skill is really basic. Everyone's reading skill is very basic. So, um, so it was interesting. And also when you read, um, the, the teacher was saying, you shouldn't listen, you shouldn't hear the words in your head because that actually slows it down. So you should just be seeing the words, understanding them, but not saying them in your head. Wow. That's why, yeah, so that's why when you read, um, generally people are quite slow. Yeah. I'm intrigued. Yeah, I'm going to have to check this out.